As you and your companions walk the streets of Waterdeep, looking for a place to rest after a long day's journey, a commotion from a nearby alley catches your attention. A man, stumbling and drenched in crimson fluid, staggers towards you. The mouths. The mouths, he repeats over and over again, almost incessantly as he grabs at your clothing. From the same direction this person just came from, you catch a glimpse of a hooded figure with chalk white skin, elongated claws, and something not quite right about their face. It looks like this figure is making a break for it down the narrow passageway between two nearby buildings. Roll initiative. Welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we talk about all manner of D&D creatures from past versions of the game, and in some case, other systems, and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition D&D campaign. I'm your host, Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we are going to be taking a look at something that I think even the D&D veterans among you will be surprised to see. Lately, I've been doing some digging outside of D&D or even Pathfinder into some other related systems that might have some interesting creatures that we can borrow. And in looking through the Numenera bestiary, I found something that I think is just incredible. For those of you who are acquainted with Numenera, just hearing the word slittykin will probably bring back some very unfortunate memories. And now, with a little help, that creature has made its way into D&D 5th edition. The slittykin is not only a grotesque, but also fascinating creature. It's humanoid in shape, but has stark white skin, terrible claws that look like they could rend pretty much anyone to shreds, and where most people would have some kind of a face, they just have a head covered in grotesque mouths. These beings are very malignant and driven by something that they refer to as the hideous game. And unfortunately, the many mortal races of all worlds are this game's unwilling participants. Now, for those of you not familiar with Numenera, it is a very different system than Dungeons & Dragons, so I'm not going to be talking about a modification section on this video because I have essentially built this creature from scratch based on what is given to us in that system. But what we are going to talk about is the way this creature does battle and some interesting ways you can implement it in your 5th edition D&D campaign. So grit your teeth and get ready because it's time for... Now let's start off by taking a look at movement. These guys are quick and they value speed over brawn. So I gave them a 40 foot movement speed and also a 20 foot climb speed. The climb speed probably won't come into play in combat too, too often, but it's a great addition to the creep factor of these creatures because I just picture them like skittering up the side of buildings and that kind of stuff, which I think is awesome. And when climb speed does factor into combat, it's always interesting. And I guess urban environments are one of the places where having a climb speed is going to be very helpful. And this thing also doesn't have eyes, so I gave it two types of senses that it can use to try to find your party members. It has 60 foot blind sight, so it can effectively see within 60 feet. And you can describe this as pretty much however you want to by giving it, say, echolocation or it just has a magical sense. Whatever you find interesting and creepy and you want to use to explain how this creature can actually sense others and interact with the world is fine. But ultimately, it's going to have a range of sight essentially up to 60 feet away. And I also give it Tremor Sense up to 120 feet away. The reason for that, again, plays up on this creep factor that this creature has and should be used. Imagine you're in a chase running away from one of these things in its lair and you know that it can sense you within 120 feet. It doesn't necessarily know your pinpoint location, but it knows there are creatures this way all running away from it. And that's how it's going to be able to chase you down. It's very creepy. Now in a straight up fight, these guys can get burned down pretty easily. Their biggest strength is that they are intelligent, so much like other creatures like Mind Flayers for example, they're going to use that intelligence to their advantage. These creatures are going to be as strong and as powerful as you, the DM, choose to make them. They're cunning, they're going to set up ambushes, set up plans, and that is what makes them dangerous. But when the time does come to actually start doing battle with other creatures, they have a lot of interesting tools in their kit, and let's talk about what those actually are. So for starters, these creatures have a trait called Whispers of Madness, and this works very much the same way the gibbering ability of the gibbering mouther does. In fact, that's what I based it off of loosely just for getting the balance and wording proper. The mouths that cover their face and head are constantly whispering and gnashing nasty things. It might be something specific to the creature they're trying to affect. It might just be total nonsense. That's up to you as a DM, whatever you want to have them saying. But the point here is that there's something magical and psychological going on with the incantations and stuff that their mouths are constantly jabbering on about. Any creature that starts its turn within 20 feet of a slittykin is going to have to make a wisdom save. And if they fail, one of four effects chosen at random is going 
going to be imposed upon them. The first of which is the voices might cause the creature to break down into hysteria. This could be manic laughing or crying, there's an equal chance of both, and a creature who is hysterical can't concentrate on spells, nor can they cast spells with verbal components. Now that may seem extremely harsh, but it is worth mentioning all of these different effects that can be imposed only last until the start of the Slittykin's next turn. So if they fail, they're going to be affected during that turn, but their next turn they won't be affected unless of course they're starting within 20 feet again and they have to make a save and maybe another effect will be imposed upon them. But the first is Hysteria, which is very bad for spellcasters, for everyone else doesn't really make a huge difference. The second effect is Panic. The creature just starts to become extremely frightened and they become literally frightened of the Slittykin and they also drop prone at the beginning of their turn. So basically they're starting their turn on the ground and they're frightened of the Slittykin until at least the start of their next turn. Again, this is going to affect your marshals more than your spellcasters, but it's ultimately not a good thing to have placed upon you just for free. Because keep in mind, the Slittykin is doing this without expending any actions, it's just like an aura effect it has around it. The next one is Violent Hallucinations, which basically means that creature seems like they're being attacked from all angles by all kinds of horrific creatures when in reality there isn't anything there. Effectively what this means is that all creatures have advantage on attack rolls against that creature until the start of their next turn. This of course is because they feel like they're being attacked from all angles so it's hard to know what's real and what isn't. And lastly we've got paranoia where the creature has to make a melee attack against someone within 5 feet of them and the Slittykin gets to decide who they make the attack against. Now granted it's possible they may not have anyone within 5 feet of them in which case this ability does nothing essentially but it can be debilitating if there's a martial character next to someone who's a little weaker such as the rogue or a spellcaster. All in all these effects aren't terrible but against certain opponents they can be quite powerful but because it's chosen at random it gives the players a chance to kind of get out of it even if they fail their save. And also I just feel that element of randomness kind of plays into the chaotic nature of this aberrant creature. Now of course at the baseline this creature does have both claw and bite attacks because nothing is worse than being bitten by dozens of mouths while you're also being torn to shreds by powerful claws. And melee attacks aren't even a bad option for this creature, it just wants to be very selective about when it chooses to engage. By the time the Slittykin jumps into melee combat it should have its opponents somewhat broken down and weakened with its other abilities. Speaking of which, it also can cast a few spells. It can cast Minor Illusion of course, which is just kind of for more flavor and auditory hallucinations because that seems kind of cool and plays into the creature's theme. And it can also cast Tongues, which is not only a useful spell, but I also figured a creature with this many mouths has to be able to cast Tongues. Both because I find that personally hilarious, but as I said it's also a good spell and why wouldn't they want to be able to speak the language of their victims? I mean, how are they supposed to taunt a creature if that creature can't understand what they're saying? And they can also cast Hideous Laughter because, again, super on theme spell and it's actually pretty useful in combat. That one they can only do three times a day, but when they bust it out, it's a, it's a great way to start out combat for this guy. Like, if they can manage to get a surprise round in a group of creatures, if they start that out with casting Hideous Laughter on whoever they see as the most powerful, then they can pretty much jump in and then with their aura ability just start taking people out. And lastly, once a day they have an option to cast both Hypnotic Pattern and Mind Spike. These spells are both very good for this creature because they have potent subdual effects, which is very important to the Slittykin. But we'll get a bit more into that when we talk about plot hooks, and speaking of which, let's talk about some. The main drive of the Slittykin is, as I mentioned earlier, the Hideous Game, which is this kind of point-keeping system that all Slittykin have with each other and where they're all competing for status amongst one another. And what this game actually entails is basically committing acts of theft, murder, torture, kidnapping, basically anything that will mess with mortal creatures in unforeseeable and terrible ways. Something that is actually mentioned in the lore given to us in Numenera is that there are most likely other elements to this game as they call it, but they don't discuss the specific rules of the game with mortal creatures, nor will they, because why would they? And it also seems to be kind of against the rules of the game to discuss the game. It's a very Fight Club-esque situation. You do not talk about Fight Club. 
But what that really tells us as a DM is that you're free to come up with whatever you think is interesting and add it into this idea of the hideous game. Maybe there are strange rituals or other components to it that don't involve mortal creatures at all that these creatures act upon and kind of gives you a neat excuse to throw in some extra flavor elements that you think would be interesting. But ultimately, it's meant to give them a drive and explain why they're so terrible and why they do just exactly what they do. Which as I mentioned, usually entails subduing creatures, kidnapping them, messing with them in unforeseeable ways, which often includes torture. As for actually using these creatures in your game, they would make a really interesting encounter if your players are spending some time in a large city. A city game would definitely want to be there because that's where there are a lot of mortal creatures that it can use to score points essentially. It's even possible players might get caught up in a feud between two slitty kin, which aren't really fighting each other directly, but are in some kind of competition that involves this blood sport they all participate in, and it's just causing havoc amongst the townsfolk. Or maybe these two slitty kin are even cooperating with one another to maximize their points, as it were, which again is causing havoc amongst the townsfolk. And like most aberrations, it would fit in pretty much anywhere that's on a different plane. It could make an interesting encounter on the Astral Sea or any really dark and creepy place. These guys just make a great denizen of a dungeon on another plane, or even somewhere on the mortal plane that is specifically meant to be kind of creepy and aberrant. Like perhaps it's not actually from another plane, but it's just a terrible creation of some wizard who was trying to combine creatures or do something high level wizardy and ended up creating this terrible monster that ended up killing him in turn. Or maybe there's a bunch of them that were all created by some kind of wizard looking at you, Thessalar, and they all managed to escape the wizard's tower and made it out into the world somehow. Or if you don't want to get that deep into it, maybe they're just a part of the world. People just know not to go out at night because there are these creatures that exist and they might end up killing you. Kind of the way Onis are talked about as a sort of tale meant to scare bad children. Maybe the Slittykin is talked about in a very similar capacity. Maybe your party gets sent out on some kind of mission by the townsfolk to hunt them down and ultimately kill whatever it is that is controlling them. And who knows what that could be. It could be anything from like an alpha, more powerful slittykin to mind flayers even. In fact, I could see these guys getting along very well with mind flayers given the right coaxing. Or if you're starting out a new campaign, this could be an interesting way to do it. Maybe you play up on the trope of all the players starting out in a dungeon, but they're actually all trapped in cages as they were all taken from their homes and families or wherever they were by a slittykin and they have to work together to defeat it and ultimately thus form the bond of the party. Ultimately, the reason I like these creatures so much is because they fall into that category of monsters that rely more on you as the DM and how you use them than their own strengths. Not to say there isn't a place for hill giants and the other monsters that are just kind of big, strong encounters, but I do enjoy taking the time once in a while to really plot and scheme behind the screen and watch my players figure it out and ultimately take down those schemes. Because those kind of monsters always have the highest potential for great story moments and epic final confrontations. Now it's very unlikely you've had this creature used on you in the past in Dungeons and Dragons, but if you've played Numenera in the past and you've either used this creature or had it used on you as a player, I'd love to hear about it and tell me what some ideas you guys might have about the hideous game and different rules or tenets you might add to that because I feel like there's a lot of story potential there that's pretty untapped. And of course, if you do want to use this creature in your game, in the description below, there's a link to the Google document, which has all the stats and everything you will need to run this creature as converted by yours truly. And if you're one of my lovely patrons, you can find the monster manual style stat block on the Patreon page or in the Patreon monster archive. And speaking of Patreon, I gotta give a huge shout out to all of you guys and just the whole community in general really for supporting me. Because of this, I was able to purchase a new camera, which as you may have noticed, today's video is slightly higher quality than it has been in the past. And that is 100% on you guys and I wouldn't have been able to do it without you. So thank you so much for your constant and honestly overwhelming support. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. I do appreciate it. And I will see you in the next video. Until then.